The following program is made possible by generous gifts from partners of Benny Hinn Ministries and viewers like you in this area. Say out loud, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son you of God. From the dead. Cleanse me with your blood, and I am born again. Pastor Benny Hinn is urgently preaching the gospel to the lost because the world's only hope is salvation through God's only Son, Jesus Christ. The gift of God is life eternal. This is your day to join Benny Hinn in proclaiming Jesus as Savior and Healer. Dr. Michael Brown is with me, and I am ecstatic. Listen, I've been waiting for this for a while. I am so <laughs> glad you're here. We are going to have a powerful program. You know, this dear man is very well known, and I saw a YouTube clip of you debating What's that rabbi's name? Rabbi yeah. Shmuley Botea. My Lord, you really got that man. And the amazing thing is you were talking to a, a group of Jewish people, I think, all of them intently listening to you. That's what amazed me. Was this in New York or where? Yeah, we, we've done debates all over America. We, we even did debate at Oxford University. But when we have them in New York City, We've had as many as 1,000 people there, and sometimes 40, 50 percent of the crowd is Jewish, and many times the really religious Jews, some of them I'm friends with, the counter-missionary rabbis, and I oh. give them seats in the front row. <laughs> so you'll have these guys in the black coat and the long beard, and they're there. So it's, it's an unbelievable opportunity uh. to speak to a lot of Jewish people that normally wouldn't hear the gospel. Listen, Dr. Michael Brown is Jewish himself. He's really a, a scholar. Now, you are, a, uh, I suppose you, you, you know, seven Semitic languages. Yeah, I, I work oh, how, with... How did that happen, by yeah, the way? Yeah, okay. I got saved 1971. I was a heroin-shooting, LSD-using, rebellious what? hippie rock drummer. <laughs> I didn't know that oh, yeah. part. 16 oh, years old, long-haired wow. hippie rock drummer. My testimony is literally from LSD to PhD. <laughs> so, wow. So I get radically saved in a little Italian... What, what year? 1971. You know, I got saved in 72. That was like the a Jesus great, people movie. Yeah, yeah, same. Hey, listen, I, I had long hair, too. I just didn't do drugs. Seriously. <laughs> All right. It was, go ahead. I, did, I mean, I would have been dead in a year or two, if wow. not for God's grace. I get radically saved. My dad's thrilled that I'm off drugs and stuff. He says, look, we're Jews. We don't, we don't believe this. And so he, he brings me to meet the local rabbi. Local rabbi says, you're very sincere. You're a nice young man, but you're wrong. And, and he challenges me about the Hebrew. Now, I knew enough Hebrew to be bar mitzvah. But I didn't remember it. I couldn't understand what I was reading. Wow. So he started to challenge me. These other rabbis started to challenge me. I said, wow, they've got good questions. I know that I know that Jesus has changed my life. I know it's real, but I want to be able to answer them. So when I started college, I started taking Hebrew classes, then Arabic, and then Latin, Greek, That's other amazing, things. Michael. And I ended up getting a, a doctorate in Semitic languages from New York University. And, and the reason was I wanted to be able to study the, the biblical text, especially the Hebrew Bible, in its ancient Near Eastern world and not have to rely on what someone else said. So if a rabbi said to me, this is a mistranslation, I could say, no, I respectfully differ. So it's been a journey to get into that. And, right. and the thing that's wonderful is the more I studied, and I studied all with secular professors. I, my first time in a seminary was to teach at a seminary. So I never went to Bible school. I never went to seminary. I studied all with secular non-believers and some of them somewhat hostile to what I believed. So Secular non-believers, yeah, you yeah. studied with them? Yeah, all, always. In other words, I was at university. I, I had skeptics, I had atheists, I had agnostics, I had an Orthodox Jew, se several Orthodox Jewish professors. So I was always challenged in my beliefs, and I thought, I'm gonna take every challenge seriously. And, and the more I studied, the more intellectually sure I was. I was already spiritually sure in my heart, but the more I studied, rather than sowing doubt, it strengthened me. And that is very important because, look, we're going to talk about Jesus and the Old Covenant. You know what is so, so shocking? You know, in uh, some of our, our services, I've asked people to, uh, with a show of hands, of how many have not read the whole Bible. Mm. And 80% sometimes of the crowd will put their hands up, which is a shock. Yeah. And then I would ask, well, why? Like, wh why don't you read the Bible? Well, we've read the New Testament, but, you know, we've read Genesis, Exodus, and then they kind of, you know, stop halfway in, in Exodus. And very few of them even understand Leviticus numbers, all that. Mm -hmm. That's because they're not looking for the Messiah in it. And today we're going to talk about Jesus in the Old Covenant because I think it's so important. But I just want to find out more about you. I yeah. am so fascinated by Dr. Michael Brown. Now, you taught at uh, 
Weren't you a part of the of the movement in Pensacola? Too, yes, I think. Yeah, I was part of the leadership there from '96 to 2000. We raised up a ministry school. You know, a lot of people say, "Well, what really happened? What's the lasting fruit?" Now, of course, a lot of people got saved. They're walking with the Lord now that were completely lost away from Him. But we raised up a school of ministry, and amazing, by God's really. grace, grads from the school are ministering all around the world. Daniel Kalenda, who's taken over Reinhard Bonnke's ministry, is, is one of our grads. And in a few days, he'll be with me here, and my son-in-law. It's going to be a great week, so don't miss it. Yes, yeah, so, so we raised up a school of ministry in the midst of the revival, and then I would teach. Fridays in the day, I would teach leaders, Saturday, general public. And then it was also my role to, to be there for theological issues. You know, I love the things of the Spirit. I love the moving of God. I, I love when Jesus breaks into a meeting and takes over. And I also love the word. It's the word and spirit. Jesus said that we worship in spirit and truth. He said to the religious leaders, you're mistaken because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. So it's not either or. We don't have to be crazy charismatics and we don't have to be dead fundamentalists. We can love the word and be full of the spirit at the same time. Listen, let's let's talk about that. Okay, I'm going to take my Bible and ask you some, some questions. Now, I kind of experimented with this myself about three years ago. And I thought to myself, what if I lived 2,000 years ago mm -hmm. and had no New Testament to Exactly. Read, okay? As a Christian, as an early believer, because we have to remember that on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved. Not one of them had the New Testament to read. So how did they find Jesus yes. in Genesis, in Exodus? How did they find Jesus in Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the books? Mm -hmm. And so I did this on my own. Now, I... You know, naturally growing up in Israel, I had the background. I've read the Bible for many years, so I knew, you know, a whole lot. But I thought I have to kind of convince myself there is no Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, mm. you know, and just focus on let's find Jesus in the Psalms or in the in the book of Isaiah. And, all. and there's many scriptures, of course, in, in, in Isaiah, which are very clearly messianic. But I began looking for portions, and you know, in some Bibles, you, you have a little star that says this is Messianic, mm -hmm. and some you don't have anything at all. But I began looking in, in, in like parts of, of Job, and I thought, this has to be about Jesus. Like, let's just take for example, Job 19, mm -hmm. verse 19 and 20. All my inward friends abhor me, they whom I have loved are turned against me. My bone cleaves to my skin and to my flesh. Well, that can't be Job. I know he had his troubles. But don't you think the Holy Spirit, you know, reveals Jesus throughout? Yeah, here, And I want to talk about that with you. Here's where I'd look at. I'd look at, say, Psalm 22. On the one hand, it's a psalm of David. It's a psalm of suffering. But he talks about his extreme suffering. Uh, some ancient Hebrew texts refer to, they pierced my hands and feet. It's not quoted in the New Testament, but if you read the King James, they pierced my hands and feet. Some Jewish texts read that they're like lions at my hands and feet, obviously tearing and ripping. But he says, I can count all my bones. Everyone stares at me. It really seems like a description of crucifixion in Psalm 22. And, and when you read it, the psalmist is delivered from, from the jaws of death, and his deliverance is so great that from the ends of the earth, the nations come to praise God. So here's the question. It, it's not written as a prophecy. Some rabbis say it's a picture of the nation of Israel suffering through history, but there's no indication of the text. It's the psalm of a righteous sufferer. And what Jesus makes clear, Matthew 5, 17, I didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets, right. but to fulfill. Everything is ultimately pointing towards him as it happens to Israel. So it happens to the Messiah. As it happened to David, so it happens to the Messiah. So here Jesus is the ideal righteous sufferer, the one alone who, who fulfills. See, that psalm had a certain meaning and a certain relevance, but it wasn't filled up. Listen, I want to, you have so much to say. I'm, I'm really going to slow you down a little bit. Now, let's go back to Genesis, okay? Okay. How, now, I know what I found, but I want to I wanna hear from you now. How would a Christian find Jesus in Genesis? All right, there, there are several okay, things. Okay, just here, look uh, at them and talk oh, to them. Okay, we see that we can trace the seed in Genesis. There's the first, That's it. All right, wow, first, first reference, first reference, of course. You're getting me so excited. Can I please just go, whoa, 
Woo! Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Please, dog. This is awesome. Uh, that's, all right. So in Genesis 3 is the first reference. It's more cryptic. The seed of the woman crushing the head of the, the seed of the serpent. There's a reference made to it in Romans, the 16th chapter. There's some ancient Jewish tradition that it's ultimately fulfilled in the days of Messiah. That, that's a little more cryptic. But by the time you get to Genesis 12, the seed of Abram, through his seed, through his offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, I'm going to stop you. Now, some will say that's Israel. Yet, Paul makes it clear it's the Messiah. Yeah, but it's both and. Okay. In other words, the Messiah fulfills the destiny of Israel. But like when God says, through your seed I'll bless the nations. Is he talking about Israel or is he talking about his son or both? Both. Okay. In, in, in other words, the Messiah fulfills the destiny of Israel. When, when the Olympic Games come, you, you read America wins a gold medal and then they play the American national anthem uh, when, when, when they're standing there getting their medal. If Israel wins a medal, it's a big news. Israel wins a medal. So the athlete is doing it for the nation. The whole purpose of Israel is to make God known to the world. Israel in itself falls short. Isaiah 49, the Messiah who is called Israel is called on a mission to Israel. And the Messiah says, it looks like I failed in my mission to Israel. And God says, no, 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 don't worry. No, that's you will actually be a light to the nations. So, so we come back to the seed. Let me, let me just go, go to that because yeah. this is really exciting. In Isaiah 14, and, and I've read that because that is amazing that God calls his son, Israel. Yes, there. Isaiah 49, 3. Yeah. And you know, and, and well, let me, let me just read this. And he said unto me, thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But then when you read the chapter, it's about the Messiah. He's a covenant to the people. Yeah. Through him come the Gentiles and so on. And his mission is to regather the tribes of Israel. Exactly. So he's called Israel because he carries the mission of Israel. He is the ultimate wow. seed that fulfills the destiny. So and it's not either or. When, when rabbis say, well, no, that text talks about Israel, not the Messiah. No, no, it's the Messiah who fills Israel's It's like destiny. with Hosea, you know, where he says, I'm going to bring my son out of Egypt. And yes. Matthew says, that's the Messiah. Exactly. But, but the nation did come out too. Right, so Hosea 11 is history. When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt, but Israel rebelled. Matthew now sees, as it happened to Israel, God's son, so also it happens to the Messiah, God's ultimate son. Let's go back to Genesis. Please. All right. Okay. All right. Keep, so, keep talking. This so, awesome. so now we see the seed. Now, here's what's interesting. The constant challenge. Abram and Sarah can't have a child, right? Now with Isaac and Rebekah, the, the promise of the seed is renewed. So now it's specified. It's, it's Isaac, then it gets specified as Jacob, then it gets specified as Judah. It's also interesting that you have the battle with Isaac and Rebekah. 20 years, they can't have a child. And, and then with, with Jacob and Esau, all of the wrestling and right. the battle over that and his children. Okay, now by the time we get to Genesis 49, we have the promise of a king, of royalty the will not through the divide. line of Judah. Exactly. And the gathering of the nations is to him. It was always about God being made known to the nations. Do you think that's why when Samuel came to anoint Saul, he anointed him with a vial, being that he was the wrong king from the wrong tribe, I mean, because Jacob prophesied the scepter will not depart from Judah, meaning yeah. that the Messiah will come from Judah. Therefore, he was from Benjamin. Yeah, exactly, wrong tribe. So when Saul comes along, he comes from the wrong tribe, from Benjamin. I've always wondered, like, why did Samuel come anointing him with a vial, not a horn? Interesting. But I mean, that's another point. Yeah, it's interesting. But it should be kind of thought about. Back to Genesis. Now, now going, let's please. stay in Genesis. Okay? Yeah, please. Genesis 22, the binding of Isaac. He, a Abraham tells Isaac, when, when Isaac said, okay, we've got, the, we've got the wood, we've got the fire, where's the sacrifice? Right. Abraham says, God himself will provide a lamb. Now, what's caught in the thicket? A ram. There is no lamb. It's a ram that gets caught in the thicket. But He actually Abraham, mentions lamb? Yeah, Abraham says, God will provide the lamb. There is no lamb, there is a ram that's caught in the thicket. So it's interesting, Jewish tradition looks at this, called the Akedah, the binding of Isaac in Genesis 22. It's called what now? The Akedah, the binding of Isaac. Wow. Very important Jewish tradition. According to Jewish tradition, Isaac was 37 years old when this took place. 
You know, later on in Genesis, his eyes fail. Jewish tradition says that's because when the angel of the Lord appeared to deliver him, that, that it, it blinded him a little bit. That's why he had high problems. It's just Jewish tradition. <laughs> but, wow. but in Jewish tradition, God reckoned it as if Isaac died and as if Isaac shed his blood. And Jewish tradition, some of this contemporary with the time of Jesus, says that when God looks at the sacrificial system, the reason he accepts the sacrifices is because of, quote, the blood of Isaac. So even though Isaac is so doesn't awesome. really die, rabbinic tradition credits it as if he did, and then it's as if he rises from the dead. That's what Hebrews says, that Abraham believed he could rise from the dead. But you're left with the question, where's the lamb? Where's the lamb that God provided? So that's, that's another interesting thing in Genesis that we look at. Genesis, the whole Joseph narrative, he becomes a type or a foreshadowing of Christ, where, right. where he is hidden from his own brothers, but he becomes the savior to the Gentile world. And then the second time around, his brothers recognize who he is. Those are fascinating things okay. from Genesis that are totally legitimate. When you get into Exodus, we are faced with the Passover. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Sure. Well, well now we have the, the significance of the lamb. We have the Passover lamb. We have the significance of the blood. We now begin to see in Exodus the importance of the blood to the point that when you get to Exodus 24 and, and the book of the covenant is read to the people, that Moses takes the blood and he sprinkles it on the people and says, this is the blood of the covenant. It's that always amazes me because I think how many animals had to die for all the, the people to be spread. A lot of blood. That's a lot of blood. A lot of blood. We, so we now see the, the beginning of this concept of substitutionary atonement or of the innocent victim taking the place of the, the guilty. We see that beginning to develop. We, we see the whole concept of, of exodus, of deliverance from the land of bondage, of course, which is played on in the New Testament. But here's something really interesting. We now see the role of the high priest and the high priest carries on his own shoulders the sins and the weight and the guilt of Israel. When we continue this over into Leviticus, we find some amazing things here, and, and into Numbers as well. What we find is that the high priest is the representative of the people. And people say, well, what's that got to do with the Messiah? Because the Messiah is from the line of David. My dear brother, this is one of the most important insights in Scripture. The, the rabbis say, we believe in the Messiah of the line of David. We believe in one who's going to bring peace on the earth. We believe in one who's going to destroy the wicked. We believe in one who's going to bring the universal knowledge of God. We believe in that. Isaiah 11, all those prophecies. We, what, when you say Jesus is going to do at his second coming, we say that's what the Messiah was supposed to do at his first coming. Ah, but David was a king who also functioned as a priest. Psalm 110 says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The, the priest king of, of Shalom. So you're saying David himself functioned as a priest. David did priestly things. He offers sacrifices at the, at the end of, of 2 Samuel. He offers sacrifices. He wears the linen ephod when he brings the ark back from Jerusalem. So David is the prototype of the Messiah, oh. and he is a priestly king. And that priestly explains so much to me about Saul when Saul tried to make that offering. That's why God rejected him, because he wasn't called to be a priest. Wasn't called, right. Yet David was. But David functioned like that. Oh, so, so here's what's so interesting. That's why the suffering passages are messianic. You see, we normally say, wow. we normally say, well, you have two streams of prophecy, the suffering and the royal. And the rabbis say, well, why do you say the suffering prophecies are messianic? Because they are priestly. And that is part of the priest's role. Listen, we're going to talk about the Psalms tomorrow. But I'm highly interested in your opinion on the, on the tabernacle now. Ah. We have about seven minutes. Can you do it? Well, sure. In Exodus, the 25th chapter, God says to Moses, the Asuli Mikdash, have them make for me a sanctuary, v'shachan tivetocham, and I will dwell in their midst. The, the word Shekhinah, or as most Christians say, it's Shekinah. Shekinah yeah. It's not in the Bible, but that root is there. It means to dwell. The Shekhinah is God's dwelling presence in the earth. So he tells the people of Israel, make for me a holy place, a mikdash, a holy place, and I will dwell in their midst. Mm. This indicates to us God's desire to dwell in the midst of his people. So how does he do it? He sends his son into the world, John 1, 14, and, and the Greek word there that's used, the word was made flesh and dwelt 
among us. It's, it literally means he pitched his tent among us. He tabernacled among us. So the, In fulfillment of the tabernacle. Right. He, exactly. he is now the walking, living manifestation. There was a rabbi who said to me, we were sitting at a kosher deli on Long Island decades ago, and I'm talking to him about who Jesus Yeshua is, and he said, you're saying he was like a walking Shekinah, a walking Shekinah God. Oh exactly. God. So, <laughs> so here, he now comes into the world, and he tabernacles among us. So he is now the walking, living tabernacle. Well, because God wants to dwell in the midst of his people. That's the whole lesson of the tabernacle. He doesn't want to be a distant God. He wants to dwell in our midst, but because of our sin, he has to leave. So now he comes in the person of his son. Jesus dies for us, makes atonement, and now sends the Spirit. So now we become the temple of the Lord. Corporately, Ephesians 2, 1 Peter 2, living stones, we become the temple that God dwells in. And individually, 1 Corinthians 6, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the earthly tabernacle, now Jesus Yeshua tabernacles among us, and now he makes us into a tabernacle for the living God. And if you understand these images, and you look at them, now you can understand God's holiness better. Principles of separation, principles of clean and unclean, principles of defilement and cleansing. You see the ugliness of sin, you see the power of the blood, you see the beauty of holiness. It becomes a whole lot more. I mean, there's so much in the tabernacle. You know, you think about the gate with the four colors. That's the four offices of Christ. You think about the altar of sacrifice, the work of the cross, the labor, the word of God. You walk in, lampstand, table of showbread, table of, of incense all about the Messiah, you know, light of the world, bread of life, mm. intercessor. You know what amazes me is the Ark of the Covenant because inside the Ark, God said to Moses to place the law and of course, you know, which, which speaks of Christ fulfilling the law in his own heart and life. But what amazes me too is the resurrection is also in there, revealed, and so much more. I am, I am, you know, I pray to God that the Lord will give every person watching a hunger, a divine hunger, to find Jesus in the Old Covenant because it will change your life as a Christian. It will establish you. It will, no storm can knock you out. Mm. Let's just, I mean, we're almost out of time, but, but just one more thing that I wanted to say uh, about we being now the, the, the temple. Please, just one more time. Yeah, because the Holy Spirit now dwells in us, we recognize that in ancient Israel, that when there was sin in the camp, God would judge or his spirit would have to depart because of sin. Now we are the temple of the Spirit. So Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, depart from sexual immorality, mm -hmm. that the calling to be holy, it's sacred. We're indwelt by the Spirit of so God. So we've become that tent. Yeah, and God tabernacles here. The end of 2 Corinthians 6, beginning of 2 Corinthians 7, come out from among them, be separate. I will be a father to you, you'll be my sons and daughters, and I will live among you. Therefore, cleanse your body and spirit from everything that defiles and perfect holiness in the fear of God. And the spirit dwelling within us empowers us to do it. It's sacred. Our law, every believer has a sacred calling to be a temple, a tabernacle <sighs> of God. What's higher than that? Dr. Michael, I'm just about to explode. Your book, The Real Kosher Jesus, what's in it? Revealing the mysteries of the hidden Messiah. It'll show you the Jewish background of Jesus in ways you've never seen. Like how? Ah, uh ah. -uh. It'll show you he's a rabbi like no other. What a first century rabbi would do and then what makes him different. We'll, we'll show you the ultimate revolutionary was a lamb. We get into the book and show how Paul was the Jewish genius who took the gospel to the nations and then secrets, things that, that very few people have understood but are clearly there about the priestly, that we touched on here, the priestly work of the Messiah. The, there's a Secret, you call them. Yeah, but, but not, not that God has hidden them from all, but most Jews reading the scriptures, they never see it, and many Christians don't. They're hidden in plain sight. The secret of the invisible God who can be seen. Jews say, well, well how can the, God's invisible? He, he's not a man. We explain the secret of the invisible God who can be seen. Even fascinating Jewish traditions about 6,000 years and how that ties in with the time of the Messiah. So it's meant to be the number one book to give to a Christian to open their eyes to who Jesus really is and the number one book to give to a Jewish person to show them who Jesus is. Wow, listen, you've got to get this book. I mean, I'm just looking at it. And by the way, this is for me. Thank you.
Person and, and, and use it together for Israel's salvation. You can get this book today, The Real Kosher. I love that, Kosher Jesus. Revealing the mysteries of the hidden Messiah for a gift of $35 to the ministry. The number is on the screen. Or you can, of course, write us, Post Office Box 16, 2000 Irving, Texas, or online. You're amazing. You are an amazing. How come you didn't come 10 years ago, Michael? Like well, here what, we are. What took you so long, brother? Just an invitation. Here we are. <laughs> Make sure to get this book, because I think this will really help you find the Lord in the Old Covenant. And what an amazing uh, life you will live as you become grounded and founded, really, in the faith. Look, a, a, a storm is coming. The important thing is make sure you're standing when it comes. And make sure you stay standing when it is gone. Because that's, that's really uh, what concerns me. Because without the word, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're lost. Absolutely. The so, word's our anchor. Exactly. Get this today, please. And yes, send your donations to Post Office Box 16, 2000 Irving, Texas. Help me go around the world. Wow, tomorrow we're, we're going to go through the book of Numbers, Leviticus, and a whole lot more, and Deuteronomy, and I'm looking forward to talking about Isaiah and the Psalms. Oh, my Lord, and Jeremiah. Didn't you write a book on Jeremiah? Yeah, I have a commentary in the book of Jeremiah. Yeah. Wow, so tomorrow a whole lot more. So when we continue tomorrow, we're going to talk about the Messiah in Leviticus, Numbers, De and Deuteronomy, and then some of the prophets, Psalms, and... Wonderful. Give me five. You got it. <laughs> Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. Don't miss it. We believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the answer to humanity and the troubles on this earth. The gospel, the gospel, and only the gospel is the solution. Pastor Benny Hinn is passionate about reaching the lost by obeying the mandate for all believers to go into all the world and preach the gospel. I'm talking about souls. Save my soul. Men and Save women around soul, the world who have not heard the gospel. It's our I duty, our privilege, our responsibility to and tell them. Who else will? Nobody will. Jesus came to give his life for men and women. And for me and for you to have the privilege to tell the world. Awesome.